Hey everyone, I'm Mao, and welcome to the Game Design Perspective. Let's get straight to the point. It's not that Final Fantasy 16 and Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth were not successful. The Final Fantasy 7 Remake Trilogy needs to wait for the last part to be released for us to actually see the sales, to understand how the sales were moving. Final Fantasy VII Remake released during the pandemic, when the gaming market was growing fast. A lot of people who played Remake decided to wait for the trilogy to end to actually buy Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. So there's still a lot of hope for that. Square Enix needs to double down during the last parts of the trilogy. They need to release the entire trilogy everywhere, everywhere they can. And then we'll see how successful Rebirth actually is. The Final Fantasy VII Remake trilogy is actually making history out there. Look at the size of the remake. We may never have a remake this size. Final Fantasy games on the PlayStation 1 and before that were huge games. Remaking them is a ginormous task. We may never experience this again. So this is a historic occasion and Square Enix should actually celebrate that once the remake trilogy is done. They need to sell the value of the entire package and at an affordable price. They need to focus on selling units and selling the brand. You can make even more money like just out of merchandise. Look at what Disney does. Yes, Disney releases a new movie every year or so, but what sells actually for Disney, like Disney sales, are made up of the parks, of toys, or of clothing. Those are the actual sales of Disney. And Final Fantasy should be doing the same. Now, the sales of both games needed to be astronomical for multiple reasons. The most important factor when considering the budget of a game are salaries. We all saw what Jacob Navok, former director of Square Enix Holdings, said. Marketing is also quite expensive. I definitely suggest you go and take a look at his tweets about the situation. We're not gonna go that deep into what he talked about. This is just my educated opinion on what is happening for Square Enix at the moment with Final Fantasy and the rest of its IPs. But why Final Fantasy 16 and Final Fantasy 7 are mainly the ones uh, that Square Enix didn't consider a hit. Now, Square Enix doesn't set sales numbers arbitrarily, but they do need to get the money they invested back. Plus, of course, they do have certain sales projections for Final Fantasy, especially after the Final Fantasy VII Remake sales. The remake sales were so good, but these sales were somewhat artificial. Because Final Fantasy VII Remake released during the pandemic when everyone needed to stay home, when video games were as successful as ever. Everyone was buying a, a gaming console. Everyone was buying games. Everyone was investing their time on video games. Of course, Final Fantasy VII Remake sold like crazy, and they were expecting Rebirth to sell like that as well. And 16 was also hit by this too. It was affected by Remake because they thought that the franchise was hitting a new level. Both games actually sold well. Hey, you're not gonna tell me that Final Fantasy 16 selling 3 million copies at launch is not a lot. Like that to me sounds like a success, but not what Square Enix's projections actually wanted the game to sell. Now there is more than meet the, meets the eye here. Over the last few years, Square Enix released some AA and AAA games that did didn't sell well. Forspoken was a very expensive game to make, and sales were extremely low. Harvest Stella, Val Valkyrie Elysium, Dragon Quest Infinity Strash, Diofield Chronicle, Ball and Wonder World, just to name a few, also didn't sell well. Now it is a, a little bit sad for IPs like Valkyrie Elysium, right, where it was a dormant IP and they may never get another shot or not soon because, well, maybe the budget for the game was a little bit too much. They were expecting more sales. That's, what, that's why they increased the budget and yeah, Valkyrie releasing was not maybe the IP to go that big on, right? Maybe they should have waited to actually make the IP a little bit stronger, similar to what the Mana series did before. When they released Trials of Mana, the Mana, Mana series was a, at a very healthy position to actually do so and the remake was incredible. That's why we're having Visions of Mana soon. Projects like Valkyrie releasing failing just dig those other projects in a deeper hole. But there's also live service games that lost so much money. Babylon's Fall, Chocobo GP, Foam Stars, just to name a few. All of what Square Enix wants to do with the mobile market as a live service. We have talked about AAA games on the channel and live service games, so I definitely suggest you watch those videos, please, because 
you're going to get a lot more insight on, on how much resources they actually take up. And that doesn't mean like, for example, Babylon's Fall was planned as a AAA game, but the fact that the game was a live service game brings it up to the AAA plane. And the team that made Babylon's Fall didn't have like the capacity to do so. So live service games are always expensive, no matter the size. And then they were also shipping games from their other smaller studios. Now they don't belong to them anymore, but games like Marvel's Avengers and Guardians of the Galaxy, right? Guardians of the Galaxy was actually a great game, but marketing just completely made it a flop. And all of those games were actually not exceeding or actually fulfilling expectations. And after selling those studios like Eidos and Crystal Dynamics, they never restructured Square Enix. And if you start noticing all of these games that Square Enix was releasing over the last two or three years mainly, like just start noticing that Square Enix was bleeding money. Like they were just losing and losing and losing money. Now I'm not saying that every Square Enix game was failing because they do have like these games that I mean like 10 years ago they would have been scoped for the 3DS that are games like Octopath Traveler, right? Bravely Default, Triangle Strategy. All of them have a smaller scope. They almost feel like a Vita or a 3DS game because after the Switch was released, well, no studio could let go of this handheld scope. And those games are actually being very successful. They don't need astronomical sales to succeed. And actually the money that they invest on them is quite low. This type of games usually give Square Enix around a 300 or even 400% return of investment. That's a lot. That's a lot. These games are being successful extremely successful but after all those years of launching unsuccessful games flooding the market with all of those like double a sort of titles has not been the best strategy for square enix and after all of those years of releasing unsu unsuccessful games to the market square enix needed a release moment and they th had what they thought were their golden geese that would finally put them back on track and stop them from bleeding money which were guess what final fantasy 16 and Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth. So if you take all of that into consideration, of course they wanted sales to be that large. Of course they, they inflated the sales to astronomical projections. There were too many variables depending on both titles. And of course they were expecting Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth to sell that well. You had Remake that was a huge success and there's nothing that Square can do that can top the hype of Final Fantasy 7 ever. Final Fantasy 7 is their most popular title ever. That's why they wanted to, to fill the market with Final Fantasy 7 stuff like 20 years ago. You had the movie, you have a, a bunch of, of spin-off titles. That's what they wanted it to do. And it's still extremely popular. Like people still love Cloud, still, still love Tifa, still love Aeris. So of course they were expecting Rebirth to be like the golden goose, even more than Final Fantasy 16. And there's one more thing that no one has considered that I want to talk about. Another issue why Final Fantasy 7 was not exceeding expectations. It's not only the fact that it was exclusive, because people right nowadays are, sell, are, are saying, oh yeah, it's because it was exclusive. Same goes for Final Fantasy 16. And yes, that hurts sale. Of course it does, for both of them. But Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth also had something against it that no one has considered. And that is, what would have happened if Stellar Blade did not release as close as it did to Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth? Because let's remember, like, the demo for Stellar Blade released, like, I think exactly a month after Final Fantasy VII Rebirth released. And it made a huge splash, and it was just the demo. And the release date for the game was actually coming very soon. Of course, some of the sales for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth were stolen by Stellar Blade. Just think about it. Both games, either we like it or not, feature a very attractive character that sells a lot of copies. Both are action RPGs, exclusive to the PlayStation 5, so that means Means they both are targeting pretty much the same audience with extremely close release dates. Now, Stellar Blade has a little bit of an edge here, and that is that Stellar Blade has no barrier of entry. To play Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, even though Square Enix and Nomura said like, no, 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 you can go and play Final Fantasy VII Rebirth without playing Remake, we're making sure that everyone understands the story because we're including this and this and the prologue and all that, that stuff. Yeah, that's not true. 
<laughs> to play Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, you do need to play Remake. And everyone understood that. Like, no one is actually confident enough, or most people are not confident enough in buying a sequel if they have not played this, the first part. And especially for a, for a story as complicated as Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and Remake are. And that's not all. Because players that are not familiar with Final Fantasy do not understand that, that to play a numbered Final Fantasy doesn't mean you need to play the six prior installments in the series. Final Fantasy fans, be honest with me, because I, I have gone through that. You have recommended a Final Fantasy title to someone who has never played Final Fantasy, and people have been like, oh man, but I haven't played the previous ones. And be honest, guys, because that has happened to me too many times. So that is in and of itself a barrier of entry. Like people tell like tell you like, no, 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 you can play it, you can play it. No number of Final Fantasy is actually related to the previous one, right? And people just don't understand like why, then why are there numbered, whatever. Like that is a barrier of entry in and of itself. But I'm just getting ahead of next week's video because I do want to talk about the future of Final Fantasy next week. Players out there could just pick a Stellar, stellar Blade copy without any issue. Something that's definitely not possible for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, even though they were gifting the uh, the remake on the PlayStation Store like it's not the same. Do you see where this is going? There were too many variables out there for Final Fantasy 16 and especially Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth to not succeed the way Square Enix wanted them to. For Final Fantasy 16, maybe we'll get a little bit more insight on, on next week on why maybe it didn't sell that much. But yeah, that's something for next week. Please tune in. I, I would love for you to watch that. Now, moving on. The Square Enix Reboots and Awakens plan is trying to address the issue Issue that has been a few years in the making. But the issue now is that they are dealing with layoffs. Controversial, well, uh, again. <laughs> Oh, that's because they are shutting projects and they're restructuring and they want to address the problem, which is some sort of a hooray moment for us gamers. But we all know that no one wants to see layoffs in the industry. No one wants to see layoffs in any industry, right? Now, I'm going to give you like a little bit of a, of a light at the end of the tunnel here. I do personally know a studio that was working with Square Enix that was affected in the good way because of this. Not everything is black and white here, remember. You see, usually publishing deals with Square Enix, and not only with Square Enix, like a bunch of studios out there do, do this, they usually go like this. Square Enix funds the project and will take the money out of every single sold copy out there until they get the money they put into the project back. This might take a long time. It might be on the very few first days, right? If the game is extremely successful at launch, or it might take, I don't know how much time, or it may never actually uh, fulfill the expectations and recoup the money. So it takes a while for the studio to actually see any profit. So this studio that I know was about to close due to this situation, due to this deal, they were lacking the funds to keep the studio going. But thanks to Square Enix's new plan, they let a lot of studios and projects go and gave them back their IPs. You can do whatever you want, it's your IP, right? Like, I will let you go. I'll no longer work with you. Meaning this studio was able to get the sales of the game. And then the game started like actually being a, a little bit successful and they got some money back and the studio is now in a better position right now. So thanks to Square Enix letting a lot of studios go, this studio actually uh, actually saw profit. It's actually in a healthier position than it was before. So remember, that's what I'm telling you. Not everything is black and white here, right? Like them letting projects go doesn't exactly mean that those studios are suffering right now. They, they might actually be in a better position position just like this studio I know but I really wish that everyone who was la actually laid off and is suffering because of this situation finds a job soon all right guys I hope you liked the video this week uh it's a little bit intense it's a little bit dense next week we'll be diving into the future of Final Fantasy the fate of Final Fantasy right we will actually be talking about what's coming up for it why like internally like for games like Final Fantasy 16 why they are not why are they not selling string of paradise too which is actually a great title and please like comment and subscribe please let me know which square enix title are you most excited for i'm extremely hyped for kingdom hearts 4 like kingdom hearts is one of my favorite games ever right and i couldn't be any more excited for them coming on steam right on my birthday it's like a gift from the gods <laughs> all right guys like comment and subscribe thank you so much for watching i'm out i'll see you in the next one